My name is Omer Arbel, and I'll start with a few words about our practice. It's slightly over a decade old, uh, and in that time we focused at the scale of an object on predominantly creating novel manufacturing methods and fabrication methods to yield form, exciting or interesting form. So in every case we focus on the intrinsic chemical, physical or mechanical properties of materials. In this case you see a steel machine bolt wrapped in copper cable that's um, dipped numerous times in an electroplating solution to encourage the growth of these nodules. Uh, the pieces are strung in cables to make what we consider necklaces for rooms or uh, we've called them sculpture or garlands. The uh, uh, chemistry is quite simple, the electrochemistry, I should say. It's, uh, it's based on an electromagnetic field uh, that's created inside of a, a, a vat with emulsified nickel particles. Um, and throughout the repetitive action of dipping and re-dipping the pieces, uh, these nodule acc nodules accrete over a three-month period. Um, you can see that the form of the piece is directly related to the method that we've invented for making it. And the same is true for this piece here, which is a light introduced about a year ago, um, which has a kind of uh, iridescent, opalescent quality that's achieved by stretching glass into numerous filaments that are very thin and very strong. And the way that's made is a technique that we've developed, which involved, involved taking glass, impregnating it with a ton of air bubbles, and then stretching it repeatedly, folding it over itself as it's cooling. In every fold, you can imagine each of the filaments uh, halves in diameter, but there's double uh, the number of filaments in total. And that's what achieves the iridescent quality and also the sort of um, rubber band form that you see. Again, the method is the driving force for the form. When we, after a decade, had the opportunity to design a, an architectural project, we wanted to apply our same material intelligence to the scale of a building. And the method that we chose to explore has been to form concrete using fabrics. This is an area that's been explored a little bit in academia over the past decade, but very little in the field. We began by pouring plaster into uh, various kinds of stretchy materials in the studio. And around the same time, I saw this fresco that was being restored um, in an antique store that was being protected by this giant shroud of fabric. Those two ideas yielded a kind of fluted form uh, with ribbed, uh, radially arranged uh, stiff members and a very flexible fabric in between, which was filled, in this case, with plaster, um, uh, and then sliced off the edges to reveal this beautiful, uh, what we consider a beautiful variegated edge. It occurred to us that it might be interesting to deepen those uh, reverse trumpet forms and consider them almost as roofs, um, and in addition, uh, make them hollow and uh, use the hollow cavity to house the root balls of mature trees. We set out to make one um, and here you see the rebar cage, the redundant draining in the inside and a conduit. The black fabric that you see is a woven tarp material called geotextile and it's stretched between uh, a, a double layer of plywood in every case to make the form. This is a, a short video showing what the piece looked like after the formwork was stripped. An interesting portion uh, of this project has been to develop a, a casting method that allowed one continuous pour. Um, a, as you can imagine, if you, conventional concrete occurs in lifts, and if we were to lift to do that in lifts, you would have not only uh, unseemly cold joints around the perimeter, but also one layer of concrete would spall in front of another with the fabric. So the way we did that is we, uh, we organized a very slow continuous pour that happens in this case over approximately 12 hours such that the concrete was curing at the same rate as the pour. Um, and the confidence that we got from the success of this first um, piece led us and our client to uh, the next phase of the project which was to design a home using that technique. This is an agricultural field so it's totally flat and the water table is quite high that means we couldn't really excavate. So the only opportunities in section have been to uh, manipulate the height and f footprint of the li lily pad forms, what we later started calling lily pad forms. In every case, encouraging a kind of choreography of space where you're always looking above or below one towards the next. Um, sectional devices that we used have been to uh, line the entire perimeter of the plan with a lower ceiling zone. 
And the, the purpose there is to uh, uh, provide a sort of shelter from the monumental space of the lily pads on the one hand, and on the other hand, mediate between interior and exterior. A second d sectional device has always been to layer the lily pads such that there's always um, a relationship between the foreground, in this case, the entry to the home and a, what we call a winter garden, uh, mid-ground, in this case, it's the dining room and kitchen, and a background, in this case, the living room. And here's a mezzanine leading up uh, above the living room. Below us, we see the kitchen, and above is the outdoor dining. We skewed the shape of the lily pad such that you could pass your hand over the textured concrete surface on your way up the stairs. I'll walk you through a plan of the home. And uh, I think there's no laser pointer, so I'll do it with my hands. Um, this is in Canada. This is in Vancouver, Canada. Or outside of Vancouver. Enter here. This is the winter garden. Oh, sorry, to the living room. Uh, the, uh, the site is an agricultural field outside of Vancouver in Canada. It's uh, f about approximately 40 acres, and it's a hay field. Um, and our approach has been to, and it has to remain a functioning agricultural field. Um, our approach to the uh, agricultural program has been inspired by this painting, this Edward Hopper painting, in which you see the knee-high um, uh, hay abutting directly onto the facade of the house without any kind of transition. We felt that to be extremely powerful and were inspired by it to basically roll the agricultural field as if it were a carpet over the entire surface of the house. And the intent there was to almost imagine uh, the house as an archaeological ruin or artifact revealed in these gaps between the, uh, the hay fields. Um, I've included this video that shows the site on the day of the casting of the two largest lily pad forms. On your right is the 10 meter tall um, uh, living room one and on, on the left the winter garden which is 9 meters tall and this is the slow continuous pour that I mentioned in this case upwards of 16 hours. And you can see the agricultural field surrounded by a second growth forest which is typical to this portion of the world. The other reason I included this video is because you can see that the day is overcast which is typical of the northwest coast of British Columbia. Most days, eight months out of the year, are overcast days. And so there's a grayness to the sky and a kind of ambient quality to the light that's really important that, that we've responded to in various ways, which I'll get to in a moment. The, one of the ways is that the trees that we intend to plant in the big pieces are uh, uh, mature magnolia trees uh, with a very bright pink blossom that occurs for approximately two uh, weeks of every year. This one is important. This is a, a shading. This one is shading the outdoor dining room. Um, whenever we've needed to, uh, we've used the same fabric forming concrete technique to make retaining walls to offer air and access to the buried portions of the house. From an elevational perspective, the strategy has been to treat the concrete works as if they were almost precious arch archaeological artifacts and build a modernist box around them, which is in this case clad in a cedar cladding which will go kind of silver, um, matching almost exactly the color of the concrete on the one hand and the sky on the other hand. So there's kind of palette of gray with this very pink bright uh, rooftop uh, scenario. Um, and then we carve out pieces of this uh, box to reveal portions of the facade and allow light in. In this case you see a west facing um, slot above the dining room uh, lily pad and the intention there is to capture the horizontal light of the sunset and reflected on the underside of that dining room concrete ceiling. And that's in contrast to the two lily pads on either side, which are skylit and scoop uh, south light above. On the detail scale, there's a wood screen. One minute. Yeah, sorry. One minute, One minute yeah. Yep. There's a screen that uh, matches the same profile as the um, uh, wood cladding outside, an east facing scoop for the kids' playroom. Um, and then their south uh, portion, and I'll, I'll end with some construction images.
Jest, okej. Okay. <laughs> yeah, very interesting project. Um, I'm quite curious, you, got, I, you showed your experimental process at the beginning, so uh, was the lily pad something that you evolved first and then found a project for it? Yes, it's uh, ongoing research that had occurred in our office for approximately five years before this project came along. And how did you uh, convince the client that the lily pad was for them? They fell in love with it right away, but the first question was what, how much does it cost and how long does it take, and I did not have answers to those questions. But the first piece that I showed you, the five meter tall uh, first experiment that we had, uh, the intention there was to sort of prove out the concept. And the deal we had with our client was that if it was a failure or too expensive, they just have a wonderful piece of garden art. But if the, <laughs> <laughs> but if the pricing was uh, uh, acceptable and, and the schedule is acceptable, that they would proceed with the construction of the other pieces. Okay. I really want to applaud you as an architect experimenting like this because I think that we so often get caught in our practices in just producing, producing without researching and experimenting and it's been a fun presentation. Um, yeah, I don't think I want to say anything else. I like the juxtapositioning between the modernist and, and your, this sort of flowery thing and I think if you were at uh, Peter Cook's lecture yesterday, I don't know if you were there, you would have seen some very interesting work that your work reminds us of. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I also admire you. And, um, but I was wondering, who is the contractor? How is it, are you part of being the contractor or how is, it done, how is that part done? And I was wondering, because this is Canada, is, uh, how do you deal with insulation? Yes, so uh, the, the contractor, the first question you asked is actually amazingly a very inexperienced young uh, builder. This is only his second home that's that he's he building. Know. Uh, and that's, that's <laughs> been like a, kind of an amazing uh, 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 gift for the project because he's fearless and he doesn't <laughs> kind of expect mistakes or he really do, goes and builds these things. It's kind of incredible, but of course, the inexperience is also costing the project a lot of inefficiencies. So that's to respond to your first question. Um, but he's external to our organization. We're not building. He's a, a totally different group. And your second question regarding insulation um, is, is the main reason why uh, the lily pad forms are encased inside of the modernist box, so that the envelope is actually most, by and large, completely conventional. Uh, the pieces are inside at all times, so the, the sort of... Yeah, but it's for me not just that part that I believe, I uh, was uh, thinking the outside, the, your uh, concrete walls around it, what, what will be clad by, by of wood. Of course, they'll be clad but, with but, insulation, but, but, but and, then insulation. A, okay. and then a cedar, uh, a cedar cladding, yeah. which the silver cedar cladding. Yeah, yeah. I'll go back to, to this image. But uh, the intent was to isolate the risk in, in, internally to the building. Thanks, Richard. Well, like Karen, I applaud you for the courage in the work. Thank I don't you. think anybody in the audience could have seen this and not thought of um, the, the wax building headquarters, Frank Lloyd Wright, and that experimentation. Um, but I've got uh, a question and then a comment which will trigger a, a question. Why? Is it because the structure is so strong, it's so efficient, it's so uh, economic, it's so sustainable? Why go through this process? And the second is the trees. I'm just uncomfortable about the trees. I buy the building and I super buy the interiors, but then I look at the exterior and I think these trees are just kind of, they're not part of the building, they're on the building. Mm. So tell me about the trees. Um, okay, to your first question of why, there's two responses. One of them is that the predominant uh, way that we construct with concrete has almost nothing to do with its fluid nature. There's no acknowledgement of the fact that it's a, a plastic material. And, so, and I think that's a shame. I think it's a shame for many reasons. Uh, from an expressive perspective, because we're treating a liquid material as if it were solid. As it, concrete construction might as well be steel or wood in most conventional construction. So there's no acknowledgement of the material quality, and that's where it stretches back to the history of our practice. But secondly, efficiency. This method has a tremendous amount of um, efficiency built into it, both in terms of labor and materials. There's uh, a quarter of the amount of waste in the, in the fabric forming process than there is in <laughs> conventional concrete construction. And the cost is actually significantly reduced from an equivalent construction 
rectangular construction because you can see it. It's, just so, it's so simple to stretch the fabric between plywood ribs. Um, your second question about the trees, that middle platform that you see in this current image is the predominant outdoor dining room. So as I said, most of the uh, eight months of the year it's overcast, but on the four months, Vancouver is one of the most wonderful places in the world in terms of uh, the sort of quality of light and the, the brightness and um, northern quality of, of, uh, of light there. So the intention is for that top platform to be the predominant dining room space. So it's an umbrella. Exactly. Right. And it's shaded by those three trees. So I, I believe the trees do interact with the spaces. I'm a little curious too about the Edward Hopper because I find his paintings have a eerie, foreboding quality to them. Um, as an inspiration, did you kind of respond to that <laughs> surrealist thing or it was more just from a landscape you I, I've always look? I've always loved his paintings because I always see the main protagonist in the painting to my eye anyway is the building even when there are very strong characters in the work I believe the real what he was really painting were, were the was the architecture so I always responded to it but in that particular case it just offered us an inspiration for how to um, gracefully meet an agricultural program with a, a pretty aggressive architectural entity. Mm. The clients weren't disturbed by being put into an Edward Hopper painting. Not that I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you. And congratulations again on uh, winner of Future Projects House, and we'd now like to present you with your award. <laughs>